And here's your prescription. I know just the pharmacy to get this filled. Who are you? A pharmacy benefit manager. A middleman your insurer uses to decide which medicines you can get, what you pay, and sometimes even which pharmacy you should go to. Why can't I go to a pharmacy in my neighborhood? Because I make more money when you go to a pharmacy I own. <laughs> no one should stand between you and your medicine. Visit phrma.org slash middleman to learn more. Paid for by Pharma. Welcome to GabFest Reads for the month of September. I'm Emily Bazan, one of the hosts of Slate's Political GabFest. Zadie Smith is the author of some novels I love, including White Teeth and On Beauty and NW. She is also a dazzling essayist. Zadie is here to talk about her far-ranging new historical novel, The Fraud. The Fraud begins in 1873 and ranges back and forth to the 1830s. It's told mostly from the perspective of Eliza Touche, a cousin by marriage and former lover of the very bad English novelist William Harrison Ainsworth. He was a real person who at one point outsold Charles Dickens, which he does not want anyone to forget. Eliza Touche is keeping house for Ainsworth, his three unmarried daughters, and his young new wife, who used to be the family servant. That's the backdrop for what's really the centerpiece of the story, which is the Tichborne trial. This is also an event pulled from real life. Sir Roger Tichborne was the heir to a wealthy family in England who was apparently lost at sea. But wait, a man who claims to be Tichborne, who probably was really a butcher named Arthur Orton, appears in England, claims to be Sir Roger Tichborne rescued. And very interestingly, the former valet of the real Sir Roger Tichborne, a former slave named Andrew Bogle, shows up in court to vouch for this claimant, this Tichborne claimant. So this is a novel about truth and fiction. And the central question, in, I think, is who in the book is not a fraud and maybe who among all of us is not a fraud. I am really pleased to be here with the novelist and essayist Zadie Smith. Zadie, welcome to Gabfest Reads. Hi. Zadie, you have said that when you learned about the Tichborne trial, it felt like a gift you had to unwrap, even though you really didn't want to write a historical novel. Why did you feel that way? I think when I first heard the story, something about the reversal, the kind of irrational reversal in the logic that millions of poor people would support the right of a poor man to claim to be a rich man, though they knew, they must have known at some level he wasn't who he said he was, reminded me, first of all, a little bit of the OJ case. There's something similar there where it was so hard to explain to people outside of a certain community that there was support for a man who in everybody's mind was obviously a murderer. But in cases of like systematic injustice in a courtroom, there will be times where you want, for lack of a better phrase, one of your own to win for once. And the Tichborne case was one of those examples. And then again, when we came to Trump, I thought about it again, that he was another man who presented to the public as something quite opposite to what he was. And for rational, rationalist political commentators, this was kind of an unbearable person, like an incomprehensible person. But for many people, it made a certain kind of sense, like fictional sense. Yeah, that's so interesting. It's like there's this real person who is undeserving, but somehow becomes the vector for expressing all of this pent up class frustration. Is that related to what you mean? Right. Yeah, that's exactly it. The justice comes through an obviously unjust vessel, I guess. That interested me. And also the power of symbol, like what all those people have in common, Tichborne, Trump, OJ, is that they become kind of overdetermined. They're not just individual people, and it's not just an individual case. It has all these proliferating meanings. And that's like fiction too. So I, I was just very intrigued by it, but it was it was a long gestation. It was like 12 years of wondering about it. And what about the kind of theme also of race and slavery, which is, I think, really important to this book? So Andrew Bogle is this former valet of the real Sir Roger Tichborne, and he becomes the star witness in this trial. He is vouching for this claimant who everyone thinks is a fraud. What did you make of him? Like, did you spend a lot of time puzzling over his motivations in real life, or did he become a kind of larger-than-life fictional character for you as well? I guess it feels very opposed to the way we think about both characters and people now. But part of fiction to me is privacy, in that 
I know it sounds ridiculous in that I, I suppose I've made Andrew Bogle. He was a real person, but I've made him up in this novel. But I don't write fiction with the idea that I know every single thing about the people I write about. So I, I don't have the final arts. I have no idea really whether Andrew Bogle believed in what he said or whether it was a calculated lie or a pragmatic lie. And part of fiction for me is is not knowing. <laughs> you're You're kind of creating a situation that allows the reader to be as active and as creative and as interpretive as a writer is. That, that's my ideal, that we're both operating together. So with Andrew, I, I never came to a final conclusion, but I was super intrigued by his story and his resilience. He's in court for more or less three years altogether, giving this endless testimony. The testimony is so astute, so subtle, so funny at times, so smart. And that interested me too, the different forms in which you can tell a story. Like I tell a story in a very quiet way in my room in private. Um, but Bogle told one on his feet in public, making it up perhaps as he went along. That's a different kind of narrative genius. And I, I was kind of excited about containing it in the novel and reproducing it, showing it to people. And you quote Andrew Bogle, his real testimony at length, right? Was I reading that correctly? <laughs> Yeah, that's all real. I mean, there's there's about 12 volumes of it in real life. I only used a few pages of it, but it was just interesting to me. Like, even from the very beginning, you know, sometimes our idea of the past can be very flat and often, particularly in recent years, perhaps, because the digital revolution is so largely American and so much of our content throughout the world, all over Europe, Africa, Asia, we take in so much of your stuff, including your versions of the past, your versions of history, that it becomes really hard to remember sometimes what our own histories are. It's like a kind of colonization of the mind. So even I, who know, I feel like I know quite a lot about 19th century British history. When I picked up those transcripts and realized, oh, here's a black man in 1873 in court giving testimony, I was almost surprised. And I thought, why am I surprised? I know there was no law against black men giving testimony in court in England, but it, it's been so long being in this kind of American headspace and I lived in America for so long that I'd forgotten the particularities of my own country. So I thought if I had forgotten, probably I wasn't the only one. So it was also fun to go backwards and actually present a history in all its complication, not the American version, our version. So Bogle's story, Andrew Bogle's story leaves into a self-contained section of the novel that is to me extraordinarily powerful. And it's about the Hope Plantation in Jamaica where he grew up. I mean, to say that this is a harrowing part of the story really like doesn't get to how um, difficult it is to read. How did you put this part of the story together? I decided not to do anything to it, just to really tell the truth. There's no exaggeration. There's no flowery language. There's no elaborate description. It's just what happened. It's what happened on those plantations, particularly on that plantation, and that's all I really wanted to convey. That there is a kind of um, tendency at the moment to think that to convey horror, you have to do things like say, this is very horrible, <laughs> or in all caps, this was a terrible thing that happened. But it's my view that anybody with the least ethical sense will read those pages and uh, understand the full horror of what happened in those places. And I don't need to do much to demonstrate that. I only really need to tell the truth. And so that's all I did. And how did you learn about that history? Well, I've been very well served. Part, on the one hand, by here in England, we have the University College Library, which has done this extraordinary uh, documentation of every plantation in Jamaica, every person upon those plantations, the jobs they did, their names, their age, everything. So in terms of... Um, research, it was a completely different experience than, you know, being 22 and having to travel far and wide to war libraries or whatever to write white teeth. I had this incredible digital resource and some amazing books. There's a beautiful one volume history of the Hope Plantation by a fantastic Jamaican academic. So like any historian, I had uh, resources. And then I tried to, um, you know, as much as I could suppress myself, that's the best way I can put it. So I didn't really make the connection while I was writing about my own quite really quite close relationship with these people. I'm 
not so far removed from that time. And I, I'm a first generation uh, Jamaican English person. All the rest of my family are Jamaican. So the the relation is close. But in order to write it, I felt like I had to get out of the picture, if you see what I mean. So I, I just thought like a historian and, and went quite without sentiment. And then after it was written, I had feelings. But while it was being written, I just wanted to do justice to it, really. Eliza Touche is also a real person, a kind of obscure historical figure, I think. Why did you decide that she was going to be your central character? What about her life intrigued you? Well, it's funny because I had no intention of writing a book about her. <laughs> That's what's so stupid about it. I spent years making all these notes about William Harrison Ainsworth. He was the subject because uh, he's so ridiculous and he made me laugh. And, and I was interested in the whole point of the book is how, how did people live on top of such a monstrosity as uh, Caribbean slavery? How, how do you go about your day when you know that's going on underneath? And that, that was the main question of the book. And he was a perfectly ridiculous example of a slightly um, unknowing, unseeing Englishman. So he was he was the idea. But but um, the moment I sat down to write, Mrs. Touche opened the door and then that was that. <laughs> William never really got a look in after that. I think the more I wrote, I saw the book is, is not just about what is ignored and, and what is pursued. It's really about rights and the order that they come in. You know, that's what really interested me that everybody wants their rights. Everybody wants their civil rights and their rights to be a full citizen. And one of the things I grew up with, I suppose, is is a kind of vague liberal idea that there is an arc of progress and that these rights come in order, you know, first working class men, then women, then different sexualities, races, etc. as if that order makes logical sense and I was interested in writing a novel that really considered the idea that everybody's rights have no time they happen they should happen at the same moment and the fact that they didn't and don't creates these incredibly powerful periods of repression frustration fury and just loss you know just loss millions and millions of people's lives coming and going in pure struggle. That's what interested me. And so uh, Mrs. Touche was a way of thinking about that order because I think she also partly believes it, right? She's, she sees herself on that road to progress and that she will be one of the people benefiting from it and one of the people trying to create the change. But at the same time, I felt in her this enormous frustration and and that, that wasn't hard to imagine. I just thought of someone like myself and thought, what if I had no possibility to write, to think, none of the freedoms I have, how frustrated would I be? And so it wasn't hard to imagine. Right. So she's a woman and she's a widow and she's in this kind of marginal housekeeper role. So there are various ways in which she's sidelined, but then also an acute observer. And it seems like you use that effectively in the book. Um, and then she's kind of trying to be an abolitionist about slavery, but then obviously is also complicit in this whole world order. So I wound up thinking that she was playing these kind of complicated roles all at the same time, which of course is like very human. I would never condemn her for that. Another question I had in my mind, and these are all questions not particularly answered by the book, but they're in my mind is how do massive injustices end? That's such a childish question, but that's what novelists ask, very childish questions. How do they end? And from reading for this book and thinking about it, it seemed to me that the answer is in a very complicated, non-linear way, involving enormous amounts of people, all of whom have different motives, different strengths, different angles, some solidarity, not always the solidarity they need, but they were all necessary. You know, it's obvious to say that someone like Frederick Douglass is a zillion times more important in a struggle than someone like Mrs. Touche. But what Mrs. Touche does isn't nothing. All of these people were involved at some level, and that interested me too, not because I need to know that about the past particularly, but because it's a lesson I need to know in the present. I want to know 
how, how could we do this? How many hands on deck? And what would it look like? There's a moment in the book where Andrew Bogle is testifying in court and he finishes for the day and a man who's in the audience screams out, Bogle speaks truth. And then I want to ask you a question that you pose in your book. Why is Andrew Bogle captivating to this audience, yet Mrs. Touche, with all her facility for language and imagination, is still struggling to make herself understood? And Mrs. Touche's answer is charisma. And I think that is one of the mysterious parts of the political process. No, I mean, you must see it in your job that, uh, you know, you, you want politics to proceed in along rational lines, or some of us do. But that is not how politics <laughs> proceeds. Charisma plays an enormous role. And this kind of personal identification that people have, that personally I wish did not exist in the political realm, but but it does. Um, and I think Mrs. Touche just can't make herself legible in the world. You know, she just isn't really there for so many people. Though the reason she came to my attention is that in the in the letters of all these great men she was always spending time with, they quite often mention her. And when they mention her, it's in a it's in a kind of nervous way, like she scares them a little bit. <laughs> and I, I love the idea that this housekeeper could scare Thackeray or Dickens or Wilkie Collins. I, what, what could she have been like? I, but I also thought that such women, I mean, Virginia Woolf speaks so beautifully about this, but if there were Judith Shakespeare's or lady geniuses, of course there would have been, but where, where would their genius have been practised, right? Where would you have the space to practise it? It would be in the home, it would be upon other people, and it would be a frustrated and twisted intelligence in some way because it didn't have free reign. So it it was quite easy for me to imagine Mrs. Touche, you know, skewering people at dinner, because if you can't do it in the book's pages, you're going to have to do it to the people sitting next to you. Right. You could be kind of privately and socially formidable, but then be confined right. to that. Kind yeah, of they're very expression. confined. And in fact, Wolf was always fascinated with reading these uh, like ladies autobiographies from the 19th and 18th century where women would, I guess, effectively, as you would say now, self-publish little books about their lives. Um, it's not that their lives were not interesting. It's just that there was no outlet for them. So that kind of frustration moves me deeply. You know, it's not something that I suffer from. So looking back always, you're thinking, well, what would have my life have been like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago? And the book was motivated out of that kind of interest in these people who came before. Wait, are you gaming on a Chromebook? Yeah. It's got a high-res 120 hertz display, plus this killer RGB keyboard. And I can access thousands of games anytime, anywhere. Stop playing. What? Get out of here. Huh? Yeah, I want you to stop playing and get out of here so I can game on that Chromebook. Got it. Go ahead, break it down real Discover the ultimate cloud gaming machine, a new kind of Chromebook. And here's your prescription. I know just the pharmacy to get this filled. Who are you? A pharmacy benefit manager. A middleman your insurer uses to decide which medicines you can get, what you pay, and sometimes even which pharmacy you should go to. Why can't I go to a pharmacy in my neighborhood? Because I make more money when you go to a pharmacy I own. <laughs> no one should stand between you and your medicine. Visit phrma.org slash middleman to learn more. Paid for by Pharma. This episode is brought to you by Google. The Google Cybersecurity Certificate provides the necessary skills to begin a career in cybersecurity. Visit safety.google forward slash cyber workforce today. We made USAA insurance to help you save. Take advantage of discounts when you cover your home and your ride. Discover how we're helping members save at usaa.com slash bundle. USAA. Restrictions apply. I'm Josh Levine the host of Slate's podcast, One Year. In our new season, we're firing up our flux capacitors and taking you way back. 1955. 1955. Oh, bah, 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 
will bring you 1955's weirdest, wildest, and most captivating stories. You'll learn about forgotten pioneers, like the TV weather girls who took the country by storm. A cute, sexy young woman was very appealing, and I can quite understand why. And you'll discover moments from the past that resonate deeply with the present, like how a bizarre conspiracy theory infected the nation's politics. Oh my God, they're trying to establish a prison camp. This is going to be Siberia, USA. One year, 1955, out now, wherever you listen. So Andrew Bogle and Eliza Touche become friendly at a point in this book. I don't know if I want to say they become friends, but they establish an interesting personal relationship. And then she also has a relationship with Andrew Bogle's son, Henry. So these are relationships that cross race and class and gender. And you write about them with, I think, some delicacy. Like, I I thought it was clear that they could only go so far. Um, Right. And one of the chapters about them is called What Can We Know of Other People? It made me think of a line from an interview that you did a few years ago where you said that identity is a pain in the ass. I don't remember ever saying that, but that sentence seems to track me from pillar to post, but perhaps I said it, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> the, a, a headline in The Guardian thinks you said it. If you didn't, right, then yeah. it's not the right thing for me to ask you about. But no, I just no, but wondered, like, what... Well, I mean, this is a sort of meta question, and novelists are better off usually when they're just thinking about real characters. But I wondered if you were thinking a little bit about these dividing attributes of these characters and how they could possibly surmount them, but then also what the limits might be. What I knew for sure is that they are, they are not us, that this is a separate time. I mean, you're talking about the divisions, but Andrew Bogle married two white women back to back in England in the late 1860s and 70s. So the divisions are not always what we assume. That's the first thing to say, that your version of history, if it doesn't include that possibility, which was a pretty regular possibility in England, isn't full enough. It's not a full enough picture of the past. That isn't to say that England is more or less racist than America. That's a completely uninteresting binary to me. But it is to say it's different. There is a lot of difference. So it's true their relationship uh, is distant, but not I think maybe not for the reason you're implying, for for as I say, he did marry two white women. I think it's much more the case that he is extremely suspicious of her, and for good reason, (laughs) because he can feel that she is somebody who wants something from him, and he's very, very tired of being exploited and used, you know, over and over again. Right. And what does she want? Is it just pure fascination? Is she trying to understand something about the world? I think she really wants to know. Yeah, she definitely wants information. I think she's slightly in love with him, a little bit besotted. Um, always very interested in anything that's different from her. Um, and I that maybe, I don't want to be too harsh on Mrs. Touche, but I do think she wants inside knowledge. You know, it, it, instead of really thinking about her relation to these plantations, she wants to kind of emotionally know about them through somebody else. Um, and then to use that information, the moment she gets it, she's very, you know, utilizes it immediately. You know, she writes about it and she wants to hold it over other people. Did you know this is how things are? Um, but there is, there are limits. And some of the limits are things like, there's a moment at the end of the book where she is really given an opportunity to do something very large for somebody else across a color line, across uh, a culture line, and she doesn't do it. And when Andrew marries those white women the key detail is that they are of the same class, you know. So the the most important boundary in British life hasn't been crossed, and so it's possible. Whereas the idea of Mrs. Touche perhaps taking in one of these children at the end of the book, I'm not going to, you have to read it to find out, uh, but uh, she won't do that, you know. She won't do that. That's a step too far. So I can't resist asking you an actual historical question. You tell us that Charles Dickens, the real novelist, the famous novelist, was on the wrong side of the 19th century debate about Jamaica, about the rebellion of enslaved people in Jamaica. So what are we to make of this? What does this, how do you think about Dickens um, when you 
include this this fact about him in all the other things that we think about him and I, his great empathy for all his characters. Maybe this is this is so far out of the the logic of present life at the moment, but I don't think you have to make anything of it. I mean, you can make what you like of it, but the idea that what we make of someone fundamentally affects them. Charles Dickens is dead. So <laughs> whatever you make of him, it's it's about yourself. You, you have the choice to make your feelings one way or another. But Dickens has written his books and is gone. So for me, it's just a fact. It's an added fact to all the other facts about him. And it's completely in line with that part of him which dreaded chaos. He dreaded, you know, fuss, chaos, violence. He didn't really want to think about the colonies particularly, apart from in their kind of most American fabulous version. But at the same time, when he went to America and went south and saw Southern American slavery, he was absolutely horrified and said he wouldn't read in any of those states. So he is a man of contradictions, I would say, like most of us. I don't know why it isn't possible to hold more than one idea in our heads at the same time. And I can hold in my head the idea that Dickens is an extraordinary writer and also was completely wrong on the Jamaican question. Right. I mean, one thing I thought about is that, and there are lots of examples of this, but sometimes I feel like we want people from the past who we think of as beloved to be um, ahead of their time in their virtue. And that's just not a reasonable test. Like they're not going to pass. But it's also, it's so narcissistic as well. Why do you assume you are ahead in virtue? Mm -hmm. I find that idea absolutely narcissistic and inaccurate to be honest. <laughs> so the, even the, the boundaries of the test don't make sense to me. And then, so so just to help me square that, so how does that idea of virtue being narcissistic square with how we would think back on this piece of Jamaican history today? What I mean is that the idea that you are the most progressive people who the world has ever seen is narcissistic and incorrect. It is presently the case that the same people making these arguments are, for instance, in a common example often given, wearing clothes made by Uyghur Muslims who are in conditions of complete confinement, for example. Or the phones that we use that we know have materials in them mined by children. You are constantly in a state of absolute uh, moral purdah around other situations. That's a situation we are all in all the time. So the idea of feeling superior to the past or infinitely superior to the past, I, f I find really peculiar. That is a great lead into the last question I want to ask you, which goes back to the title of your book, The Fraud. Is everyone in the book a fraud? Yes, but that's okay. It's okay. <laughs> you can still come together in large political movements of solidarity and not be Jesus Christ himself. That is not necessary for political action. All that's necessary for political action is will, solidarity, and action, not perfect humans. That is not what's necessary. And what's the role of writers and storytellers here? I mean, are they frauds? Is it actually helpful? Almost always. I, I have no idea. It's not, first of all, it's not for any writer to tell the public in what ways they are helpful. That is another narcissistic delusion. But what I hope for, that you could say that, what I hope for is, again, when I think about people who actually are serious political actors, who are actually performing grassroots actions, changing things, putting pressure on people out in the streets, those people who I admire very much. The only thing I think writers can offer them is a slightly more complicated version of the people. That's it. So that when they're out on the barricades talking about the black man, the white man, the cisgender, whatever they're talking about, that instead of that flat cartoon person, what writers can offer is a slightly more complex version of the people that they're fighting for, of the people themselves. That is as far as I have ever hoped anything I've written to go. And if it can be utilized in that way and used in that way, I'm always happy. But, but nothing more, I assume nothing more. Zadie Smith is the author of the novel The Fraud, which I feel like I now have an even deeper understanding of why this book speaks to our time, as well as complicating and unraveling its own 19th century era. Zadie, thanks so much for talking with me today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. 
That's it for this month's edition of GapFest Reads. Our producer is Shana Roth. Ben Richmond is Senior Director of Operations of Podcasts. Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio at Slate. We'll be back next month with another edition of GabFest Reads when David is going to interview the writer Christy Coulter about her new book, Exit Interview. Until then, all three of us, David and John and I, will be back in your feed on Thursday with a new episode of Slate's Political GabFest. Thanks so much for listening.